maybe you heard the story of a jewelry designer, and her name was Diana Dicer. She made a grilled cheese sandwich while she was working on some drawings. And she took a bite out of the cheesy goodness. And as she took a bite out of it, she was marveled and had an epiphany. She noticed etched in the burnt mark of the bread of the grilled cheese sandwich what appeared in her imagination as an image of the Virgin Mary. And when she saw that, she presumably wasn't hungry anymore. And she took the grilled cheese sandwich and she put it in a box. And 10 years later, she, she saw the box and opened it up. And she was astonished because no mold grew on the sandwich. And so she unveiled this sandwich to the world. And there was an amazement with this grilled cheese sandwich with what some would say is the Virgin Mary on it. So crazy was the interest in this that the Golden Palace Casino bought it for $28,000 on eBay. There it is. There it is. We are fascinated with images of the sacred and the divine. Just goes to show. The perception of the inspirational face has influenced and it has inspired legends throughout history. One of the first legends about the face of Jesus was Veronica's veil with its likeness of Jesus that was stamped on it. And we all hear these days about the Shroud of Turin. And then there's also the story of Stephen, the martyr, who declared he saw the face of Jesus smiling on him from the right hand of God. And we also hear of God bringing his face to Paul defending his office as an envoy of Jesus who claimed that he had saw the face of the Lord on that walk in Damascus, that highway. Well, when Roy Brower of this congregation learned that I was working on a message on the inspirational faces of Jesus, he sent me this image. Now, this one of all places was published in Popular Mechanics magazine. How it ended up popular mechanics, I don't know. But it was published years ago there, and it is a proposed historical interpretation of Jesus' countenance based on anthropological estimates of body styles and features in the time of Christ. Roy wrote this. I've always thought growing up that Jesus probably didn't look like the pictures in our Sunday school rooms. I think this countenance gives me comfort in relating to the historical Jesus. Well, it is um, a strange thing that there is no description of Jesus in the Bible. How he looked, or even his stature, or the color of his hair, there's no mention concerning how our Lord looked. And I think there's a reason for that. Because I think that that is all part of the revelation of God, that that is absent. And it is left how perhaps the Holy Spirit may make that face known in our lives. Because there are things that language itself cannot describe. 
but it is a spiritual reality. It is something that all of us contemplate. We have feelings and impressions. What does the face of God look like? How did Jesus look? Well, we have no actual description. However, there are some things that we do have that as a community of Christ followers, I'd like for us to perhaps get our arms around. We do have what I would call spiritually driven, imaginative impressions of the likeness of the face of Jesus. And a starting point for that is from the letter of Paul that Jackie read earlier today to the Corinthian community where he wrote, For God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed what? In the face of Christ. The face of Christ. Now, on this Lord's Day, as, as, as you frame that and think about that today, I would encourage you in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a place where you can be still and have some silence and contemplate as you read that to also open your Bible to Exodus 33 and 34 because Exodus 33 and 34 it has been an inspiration for what we find here from Paul. Paul mentions this and he discussed Exodus 33 and 34 in the previous chapter, Corinthians 13. 2 Corinthians 13. And what happened in Exodus? What happened to Moses that he's referring to? It is that story of Moses going to the top of the mountain, and Moses speaks with God, the two of them face to face. And when Moses came down from the mountain, his face shined. There was a radiance about him, and it shined with the glory of God. And it reflected the presence into which Moses had been standing for 40 days and 40 nights. Can you just imagine that? And so the story reads in Exodus that when the children of Israel could not look up and see the glory of the shining of God in the face of Moses. It was so bright, he had to put a veil over it to cover his face. But now, in the time of Christ, looking at that radiance of the face of God, Paul uses that story as an illustration of the glory of God that shines in the face of of Jesus the Christ. However, it never fades away. What beautiful imagery of this radiance going on in the face of God. Now I want to follow that through to a couple of places. A couple of other places in the New Testament where there is yet again another glorious appearance of the face of our Lord the first is the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus at his transfiguration. And what the Bible says is just one thing. That at the transfiguration of our Lord, it says his face shined. His countenance was bright as the sun. Now, that observation, bright as the sun, is mentioned several times in the New Testament. Not just at the transfiguration, but also a second time when Saul of Tarsus, who would soon be named Paul by Jesus, was on the road to Damascus, and Jesus appeared to him. 
And the Bible describes this appearance as the brightness, again, of the sun. And in the light of that glory, Saul was blinded. And he fell to his face on the ground. But also glorious, just to think of it, to have witnessed mothers placing their little children into the arms of Jesus or the face of our Lord as he bent over someone who was sick and touched them and healed them or the crippled and healed them or the tears of our Lord, thinking of that, streaming down his face as he wept over Jerusalem. Or the tears streaming down his face as he wept at the tomb of his friend, Lazarus. The face of Jesus, we find, is a face of redeeming love. It's what it is. One of my favorite stories about that, and it is probably a legend, we don't know, it has to do with Leonardo da Vinci. When he introduced to his friends his famous painting of The Last Supper. The story goes that as there was this chorus of oohs and ahs, people were enamored when they first went into the room at the lace work of the painting. They were ooing and aahing at how was he able to have such detail at that. And the story goes that Leonardo then takes a brush, he dips it in some paint, he wipes out the lace work, and he says, fools, look at the master's face. Look at the master's face. They almost miss the glory of the meaning of the painting by looking at the lace work. I think that is insightful for those of us who seek to follow the Christ, that we not get off course or off directed into peripherals and not gaze at the face of Christ. For as we open the pages of Scripture, more than a dozen times, we hear that phrase, His face. It is used throughout the New Testament. Matthew depicted the brightness of it when he wrote, His face did shine as the sun. And he also wrote of the agony of his features when in Gethsemane we find in the scriptures where it says he fell on his what? Face. He fell on his face and he did what? He prayed. And then we have Luke portraying the determined look of Jesus when he wrote he set his face to Jerusalem. Nobody tells us what he looks like. Yet the New Testament itself is what he was like. And his face gave a vision of hope. So fast forward. Here we are today. It is a, an important, significant, critical time in the life of the Christian church. And it is also a very critical time in the life of this local church. And it has all to do with what we set our faces to. Because when all is said and done, his face is reflected in our faces. And so then the question is, what do people see? What do they see? What do they hear? It is for 
inspirational creativity, the Lord has left the option of how his son will be pictured, that it would be generated in the lives that we live and the things we do as a church. So I would encourage you to look at the various images that's out there that has inspired artists to in some way put onto canvas or in stained glass an impression of sacred and inspiration and beauty that is stayed, it is frozen in time and without something else to paint a new picture or to be a new reflection, it would just be a historical event. So I want to encourage us as a congregation to let people see the brightness of Christ in what we do. Now, pastorally, I have to be honest with you. I have some concerns. I have some concerns for our church. I'm positive, I'm encouraged, but I have concerns. One of the biggest concerns I have right now is something that I want us collectively as a congregation to, to talk about, to be concerned about, and it has to do with what we're doing for our kids. We have a place to worship, but we don't really have much of a place for them to have Sunday school in. We really have not in all our years provided an adequate place where people can do part of what our mission is, and that is to learn about the faith, to become leaders in that. We treasure the importance of fellowship, but we really don't have an adequate facility for that to be done. Now we've been improvising this summer because we're able to, to go over to the parsonage area and, and provide food and have fellowship, but we can't do that here. We don't even have a kitchen. Another interesting note, just, just historically, and this is what is driving part of this. The highlight of our enrollment of kids in Sunday school reached the peak of 42, 42 kids. And that was in 2014. And uh, what happened, the parish house, which is where our resident composer lives, though some of you remember, that's where our Sunday school was. And it was bursting at the seams because they had a place to go to. They outgrew the facility here. But then we had another problem. It was unsafe. That's a lot of kids and teachers to meet in a small building. And then it was, it was also unsafe because in inclement weather, they had to walk there and cars were driving in and out. And, and it, it just, we heard from the parents loud and clear, we, this isn't working anymore. And so in 2015, it was decided, well, let's build some partitions and try to make it work here. And we closed that down because we felt we needed to not make it a, an unsafe place. And it worked for a while, but every year the numbers diminished. I asked Joyce Hawkins of our uh, discipleship team. They're responsible for Sunday school. And, and this was before COVID, by the way. It's not a COVID issue. COVID just made it worse. I said, okay, uh, Joyce, what's our Sunday school enrollment looking like for this year? And she goes, maybe 10. And I, I just throw that out because we've not been able to, to tackle that yet for good reasons. And I just want to say again, ask that question, what is the face of Christ for all people? What do they see today? And how are we in a position to maybe make something happen? Not sure exactly what the answer is. We're looking at options, but it is a congregation-wide discussion that I want us to talk about and not just be comfortable with and say, well, that's just the way it is because many churches have closed. It's been our size through COVID. It did them in, and God has blessed us. I think God is saying, I want my face 
to shine in you and through you. So perhaps God is saying something to you and saying, you know, let's, let's be a part of a new thing. Let's, you know, you, you can, uh, the most costly thinking an organization can ever have is overthinking. Overthinking to where nothing is done. And so I just wanted pastorally to share an image that I want to have of the Christ in this church. We've never been able to afford anything we've done. And for some way, God has provided things to happen. And he's saying, Lonnie, don't forget that. Because I will build my church. His face is reflected in our face. What do you reflect? How do others see Jesus in you? Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. For the brightness that we see in this place. For there is a radiance that gathers us. That makes us celebrate the at handness of your kingdom. We just uplift before you, Lord, these challenges that we have had to do what you have asked us to do in our mission as a church. May your face shine in the light of your people. Amen.